this video we'll focus on what I believe is the most important message in Arrival and the most important message of our time. Arrival doesn't really tell a story about how to communicate properly with aliens, at least not first and foremost. As with all science fiction, it tells us something about the society and time period it was created in. And there's a weird echo chamber that happens in different countries and even in different communities within a country where we put a filter on anything from someone else. So how is this reflected in the story? I will answer the question by introducing you to the works of several philosophers that have contributed to the understanding of the human ability to communicate, each with their own linguistic theory. In Arrival, Dr. Louise Banks faces a steep learning curve when she is tasked with mastering the language of a sophisticated extraterrestrial culture that has come to our planet. The alien species communicate using ink blots shaped as circular logograms, as opposed to how humans structure language as words organized into phrases. Dr. Banks has to overcome this challenge. The world as we know it hangs in the balance. However, it would be quite difficult to translate a completely foreign language from scratch. It has been suggested by some philosophers that it is impossible. They come to this conclusion by using the radical translation thought experiment by Willard von Orman Quine. Quine pictured a linguist encountering members of a local village, speaking a tongue that is totally unconnected to any other language on earth. It would be inconceivable, according to Quine, for the linguist to be assured that he is ever going to be competent in that native tongue. Quine's argument, however, requires some prior knowledge in the philosophy of language. The philosophical subject of what words signify and how they come to have meaning was most notably addressed in the early writings of Ludwig Wittgenstein. He believed that by solving this puzzle he could resolve, or better still, dissolve, every significant philosophical issue. According to himself, he accomplished this in the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. Wittgenstein makes the argument that the world is all that is, and as a result, words must have the same meanings in the world as things or people they refer to. When I say the salt is on the kitchen counter, I literally mean the kitchen counter as the actual item to which the phrase is referring. Hence, a term is worthless if it does not refer to an item or relationship in the real world. This theory is known as Wittgenstein's picture theory of language. Wittgenstein stated that most philosophical issues are ultimately pointless since they often deal with abstract metaphysical ideas or morality rather than actual situations of reality. For example, the moral maxim, murder is wrong, has no reference to anything in the outside world. Wittgenstein said that such inquiries should be ignored as a result. The paradoxical fact that he was a philosopher meant that, by his own logic, even his work had no value. The question, what is meaning, is meaningless since it is an abstract philosophical topic, according to this line of reasoning. Since the term meaning does not relate to an entity or relationship in the outside world, it has no meaning. The irony was not lost on Wittgenstein, who addressed this in the tractate's conclusion. He thus maintained that there is a distinction between nonsensical statements and senseless assertions. Despite the fact that his words are meaningless, there are certain forms of senseless language that may be beneficial. The axioms of logic and mathematics, such as 2 plus 2 equals 4, are statements that fit within this category. Even if it is meaningless and technically refers to nothing in the real world, it is nonetheless a valuable tool that you use to get a job done and then lay aside once it is finished. After writing the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, Wittgenstein renounced philosophy since he believed that he had dissolved all the main philosophical issues. This, in fact, contributed to the development of the philosophical school of thought known as logical positivism, which held that a claim is worthless unless it can be verified. It is not even significant if something cannot be theoretically shown to be true. 
There were essentially two factors that destroyed logical positivism. First, it is cancelling itself out because, ironically, the statement, a statement is meaningless unless it can be verified, is impossible to verify. Secondly, and also quite ironically, it was demolished by Wittgenstein himself, who after leaving philosophy, realized that meaning doesn't function the way he initially assumed. He experimented with a variety of careers, including teaching young school children. And when he did, he realized he had been mistaken about what constituted meaning after seeing how youngsters acquire language. According to the findings, words do not gain meaning through relating to the outside world, but rather by serving a purpose. Wittgenstein came to understand two things. First, the meaning of a word is not inherent in the word itself. Terms do not naturally express what they are used to describe. Secondly, function defines meaning. Wittgenstein observed that children learned language by experimenting and determining whether their use of specific words and sentences was appropriate instead of matching words to specific objects. To put it another way, a child uses words and phrases and determines whether she has done so correctly by observing the reactions of others in her environment. If the youngster utilizes a phrase the same way as her community, she will get a favorable response and continue to use the phrase in this manner. If she doesn't, she will encounter resistance and attempt to apply it using a new method the next time. She will learn the meanings of words and phrases in this manner. Therefore, even if for example the term condolences doesn't relate to an actual thing or person in the world, it might nonetheless have meaning. And by learning how it's used, you can understand what it means. Learning a language is simply learning how to utilize that language in a particular culture. This brings up Quine's issue with radical translation once again. According to Quine, it is impossible to learn the meanings of words in a language that is wholly unrelated to our own, since even learning the use guidelines for a language game may not always disclose the meanings of the language's words and sentences. Quine provides the following example. Imagine that we come upon a tribe that has not yet been identified. Then imagine that we are speaking to a native and they point to a rabbit while saying Gavagai. Though he could have just been referring to a particular part of the rabbit, like its head, we will probably presume that he is talking about a rabbit. To be unambiguous, you therefore point to its head and says Gavagai. But you still wouldn't be able to be certain that Gavagai means rabbit, even if you tested it with every rabbit part and eliminated them all. Cause it may also mean undetached rabbit part or animal, or even food. Dr. Banks makes a similar argument when she tells the fabricated tale of James Cook. In 1770, Captain James Cook's ship ran aground off the coast of Australia and he led a party into the country and they met the Aboriginal people. One of the sailors pointed at the animals that hop around and put their babies in their pouch, and he asked what they were, and the Aborigines said, kangaroo. And a point is? It wasn't until later that they learned that kangaroo means, I don't understand. When you discover that the only way to learn use rules is to search for either positive or negative replies, one realizes that the issue becomes much worse. However, how do you choose those? You're attempting to learn their language, so you don't know how they say yes and no. Instead, you just nod and shake your head. But even nodding and shaking your head is just another social fabrication. You may pick up the rules of their language game and still misinterpret the meaning of each and every phrase. Even if you seem to be communicating with one another during the whole chat, both parties could be utterly misunderstood. This appears to be the approach Dr. Banks takes, not without irony. She writes human on a whiteboard and then points to herself, thinking that the aliens will respond by saying the name of their species. But instead, they may interpret her writing as referring to basically anything. For example, her womanhood or the outfit she is wearing. How then can she be sure that her translations are accurate in the end? The effects of this reach beyond the plausibility of a rival story. We are all in this predicament as kids, if you think about it. We are attempting to learn a language that is entirely unlike any other language we are familiar with, since we still don't know any languages. We acquire our native tongue exactly like a linguist does with an unfamiliar tongue. Could it really be that we all mistakenly believe we comprehend one another, while in reality failing completely? Although it sounds improbable, it is possible. 
This is where we might discover the solution to Quine's concern. It could be that we all use the same terms but have different definitions of them. Of course this is not black and white. It is likely that we all have the same meaning in mind concerning most words. Now you may counter that Quine's theory is refuted by the apparent success of so many language translations throughout our history. You might say that these accurate translations just show that no human language is entirely alien. Our brains are surprisingly similar, and we all evolved from the same branch of the evolutionary tree. As a result, we probably have similar conceptions of the world and of language. Gavagai is better translated as rabbit, not detached rabbit part. Such impractical thoughts as detached rabbit part is not something we humans add to our language as a particular word. Noam Chomsky, a philosopher and linguist, has made a strong case for what is known as universal grammar. A set of intrinsic structural rules, limitations and principles that govern how all people arrange thoughts and utilize language. In essence, Chomsky claims that while there are norms that kids need to be aware of in order to learn how to use a language, they are never ever explicitly expressed or included in any utterances they hear. Children seem to instinctively comprehend these guidelines. They naturally pick up the specific rules of, for example, English from the utterances. They take note of references to certain nouns and verb tenses, but the rules about how to use them and how to tell the difference between a noun and a verb seem to come naturally. If Chomsky is correct, since no human language is entirely alien, the linguist in Quine's hypothetical scenario is not really confronted with the issue of radical translation. It's interesting to note that Wittgenstein offered a similar answer to this conundrum in his philosophical research. He said that our frame of reference for understanding a foreign language is the ordinary human conduct. According to Wittgenstein, we may overcome the issue of radical translation since we share certain fundamental human behavior patterns with the indigenous tribe. This notion is related to Wittgenstein's assertion that language use is an essential component of existence. Or, to put it another way, it's a universal social custom in which our linguistic games are ingrained. In other words, no human language is entirely strange to us since we all share a type of life. However, this wouldn't apply to non-human animals. Wittgenstein claims that even if a lion could communicate, we could not comprehend it. This takes us back to a rival, because it's unlikely that extraterrestrial life forms and our own would coexist. We most likely wouldn't share a universal grammar that developed under similar circumstances on a different planet. It seems very improbable that aliens would see the world and use language in the same manner that humans do. In fact, humans may be able to understand a lion's language more easily than an extraterrestrial one. We at least know that lions have similar senses as humans. For instance, aliens may not have sight or hearing. Unless evolution somehow ensures the essential conceptual commonalities, or maybe there is a universal logic to how communication functions, and this is somehow reflected in our shared grammar throughout the universe. In arrival, both of these concepts are true at the same time. Dr. Banks can learn the foreign language because of a common conceptual framework, but she also shares the alien's intellectual framework after learning their language. She starts to experience time as they do, seeing past, present and future simultaneously rather than just one instant at a time. She develops a four-dimensional perspective. She knows before she marries Ian Donnelly that they will have a girl together, that this girl will pass away from a fatal disease, and that this will cause their marriage to fall apart. But she still goes through with it. This brings up the linguistic hypothesis that the movie specifically refers to. You know, I was doing some, some reading um, about this idea that if you immerse yourself into a foreign language that you can actually rewire your brain. Yeah, it's that warf hypothesis. The superior wharf hypothesis may be expressed in a rigid form and a non-rigid form. In arrival, we are presented the rigid form. The language you use shapes the way you think and how you see the world. In a less potent form, the superior wharf hypothesis just implies that our language concepts affect our choices and thought processes. But the fundamental concept remains the same. The conceptual structure of the language you use has an impact on how you see the world. Because 
because of this, Dr. Banks is able to observe the universe in four dimensions after she has learned the alien language. The Sapir Whorf hypothesis has been examined since its inception, and it seems that it is false, at least in its stronger version. For instance, the lack of words for particular color hues does not prevent people from recognizing such colors. But in its lesser version, it could still be accurate, at least in certain cases. According to whether the object's noun was regarded as masculine or feminine in their native language, German and Spanish speakers in one survey characterized objects based on the gender of the object's noun. A key is hard, weighty and serrated, according to the Germans. The identical key was characterized as little, lovely, shiny and tiny by Spanish speakers. Our journey through these linguistic theories teaches us that proper intercultural communication is not something we should take for granted. Even though humans most likely have an inherent ability to create a common framework, the differences in our cultural thought patterns are related to our language. So why do I think this is the most important message of our time? We humans have an uncanny ability to alienate each other. In this globalized, multicultural world we live in, subcultures with completely different worldviews exist in the same geographical locations. The polarization we see in Western society today is closely related to the fact that we can't even agree on word definitions within these subcultures. We speak past each other even though we most often want the same things. Love, safety, food on the table and hope for a better future. Arrival shows us that if we can't agree on what words mean, productive communication becomes impossible. This is the most important message of our time because without an ability to communicate properly, all other endeavors of brokering peace are surely doomed to fail. While the majority of humanity is willing to start an intergalactic war with an alien species because the words tool and weapon are conflated, Dr. Louise Banks risks her life for the greater good. She reaches out to the perceived enemy and ends up preventing a world engulfing war. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, then consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. I will post much more of this type of content in the near future. Until next time, stay curious.